thank you for inviting me. It's an honor to be here and to contribute to this seminar here. Um, my name is Andreas Gegenford and I stand here as the representative of eye tracking research. Eye tracking being one of the ways you can collect data technology in hand. Um, I will not talk about mobile devices right now. Um, we have two examples now that use those. Um, this time I focus a lot on eye movements and eye, uh, eye tracking. Um, and I will give you some examples of how eye tracking can be used um, as a way to collect data, particularly on visual expertise. Um, it's funny that I'll talk, talk about visual expertise because I myself have of course, little visual expertise, uh, but I hope you can still enjoy that. Um, expertise in the visual domains is very important in you know, different kinds of settings. For example, uh, yesterday evening I was flying into to London uh, Heathrow and I was hoping very much that my air traffic controllers would do a very good job <laughs> handling all those complex visual data that they see on their radar screens. Uh, typically they are very quick, within a few seconds they can spot if any planes might collide and then can immediately react uh, on those threats um, in, yeah, in the air of London. Another example of very complex visual domains is uh, the medical domain. This is an example here of a of an X-ray of the chest. Um, and also here we see that radiologists are extremely quick in uh, realizing whether or not we have uh, cancer or pneumonia represented in this uh, radiograph. Within split seconds, which would take medical students a very long time to get their scanning the image, you know, randomly trying to make sense of all the different shades of gray, anatomical structures, and all the visual features you see on this uh, image. And a third example, of course, not only in uh, air traffic control or medicine, but also in more educational settings, such as schools. Uh, we know that also teachers, um, I think many of you will also teach, but uh, probably in, uh, in higher education, uh, other teachers have a very demanding visual field in front of them when they have to teach. Uh, they have to scan, you know, different students react to those um, situations as they unfold uh, in the classroom. Um, I will use some of the examples now from a group, particularly in medicine and uh, classrooms, um, to illustrate um, a few things about eye tracking that can be used in visually to collect data and give a few reflections um, on those topics. Um, particularly first, I would like to talk about a few models that have been developed in the past on visual expertise. Uh, I would then like to introduce eye tracking as an alternative measure that could be used uh, alongside the measures that exist already. Then, uh, as I said, give a few examples and finally offer some reflections and indications of using eye tracking um, to trace the development of individuals as they progress on their expertise um, development over time. Um, let's start with the first existing model of visual expertise, and here I would like to um, ask you to contribute. Um, the next slide now shows 27 numbers uh, in a line, 27 numbers, and your task would be to try to memorize the 27 numbers in only 10 seconds. <laughs> Are you ready for the task? The next slide shows numbers. Here we go. You have five seconds left. <laughs> Okay, thank you very much. Who thinks has established, you know, who can memorize now, more or less, hands up? Who feels confident? Yeah. Uh, uh, how many of them? All of them. All oh, of them. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> it's a very demanding task for those not trained in those memory activities. Uh, memory experts are very quick in uh, making sense of those very long uh, series of numbers because they can chunk this uh, different numbers into, into meaningful units uh, and use those units as a larger you know, organizational principle and therefore have a very quick uh, and very efficient um, procedures to uh, encode this series here into memory. Um, this has been studied a lot in the past in expertise research in clinical psychology uh, and has been related um, to the work from Anders Ericsson as we to work in Florida now. Um, he was the one who um, proposed this theory of long-term work in memory. Uh, in his theory, he says that um, expertise, as it unfolds, as it develops, uh, will also change our memory structures. It will optimize 
um, the speed of information processing. They're much quicker uh, compared to novices in domain-specific uh, tasks and situations because we developed retrieval queues that will bridge long-term memory and working memory in very efficient ways. And thus we are very, very quick in, for example, memorizing um, a very long number of um, series of numbers. Um, this is one example from the past. If this is true, this assumption from long-term working memory, then it should also be reflected in eye tracking data. Particularly, experts should have a much shorter fixation duration. So they should be able to use very quick glances uh, on an image compared to non universities who should have much longer fixation durations on domain specific material. That's the first example, uh, first theory established. Uh, it has been developed largely in the past using verbal protocol data, not so much eye-tracking data, unfortunately. Um, but we will see how we can bridge that gap. A second theory I would like to introduce this uh, afternoon is um, uh, shown in two slides. The next slide again shows an example now for you, a little task. Uh, I think you have it already in your, uh, your hands, out, right? Uh, the next slide shows many, many different animals. And on this picture, there's one ice bear, polar bear, somewhere hidden among those uh, animals. And your task would be to very quickly try to locate the polar bear. Are you ready? Here it comes. <laughs> if anybody spots the polar bear, please raise a hand. Oh. Yeah? <laughs> Wonderful. <laughs> Experts and reflectors. The polar bear would be somewhere here. <laughs> <laughs> because you have now spotted it so quickly, this would indicate that you have uh, possibly scanned the image and perceptually ignored a large portion of it that it's not you know, related to anything. Let's talk it earlier in the handout. Or that you have <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. <trading> it, perhaps. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Well, uh, in terms of uh, cognitive theories of expertise, um, we have one particularly important framework from Hilde Heider, um, now in Cologne, who coined this term of information reduction hypothesis. She um, proposes that as expertise develops over time, um, experts typically try or aim to ignore perceptually those aspects in our visual field that are redundant for a task, and they focus instead on areas relevant for completing a task. I think we know many examples of our daily lives as well, where we just ignore perceptually things that are redundant or irrelevant for our um, task at the moment, and concentrate our attention selectively on those areas that are salient and relevant for our task at hand. Um, if the assumption here was true from Hilde Heider that we indeed um, select um, our attention resources to those areas relevant for certain um, task procedures, then this should also be reflected in eye tracking data. Particularly, we should have, of course, much longer fixations, uh, much more fixations of longer duration on those visual information that is relevant for the task, and um, less fixations of shorter duration on aspects irrelevant or redundant for our task. That's the assumption um, from the data here. A second very important framework to explain visual expertise again. Um, initially developed using verbal data, not eye tracking data, has been used later on to validate that theory. That's the second big theory framework. I have a third for you. Um, and then I'll go back in history, back to expertise, research, which has been grounded strongly in the chess domain. Then if you're playing chess at home sometimes, and you just play it around, very good. Um, the next slide will show you a chess board. Uh, and your task would be to those of you who know the chess rules um, to see whether or not we have a checkmate situation or not. Is the king threatened um, or not? Yeah, is the picture? What do you think? Is the king threatened, the white king particularly? Hands up. Oh, the white king. Yeah. Is it safe? And uh, yeah, we see classically here that the king is in a very bad situation. <laughs> Being eliminated. He's about to Expertise research in those paradigms have been used extensively um, to um, test the 
superiority of experts, of chess masters, of grand masters, compared to chess novices. Um, and it has been related strongly also to the visual aspects of information processing in those chessboard situations. Um, it has been related to the concept of perceptual automaticity. He developed from Rangel, the Canadian researcher in Toronto, um, who stated that probably we have um, the ability, as we become experts on um, a longer time, we have the ability then to also see paraphobia, things that are not directly into our phobia, but rather into you know, barriers on the borders of our visual field. We can even um, process information there, even though we have no direct fixation um, on certain objects or information in a visual field. Another very good theory, strongly grounded in evidence, particularly again using lab data and verbal data, um, has also been used nowadays with um, eye tracking data to validate the assumption that an expertise develops, also a visual span extends, and we are able to process information on the borders of our visual field. Now, as I said, historically in expertise research, we have used um, verbal data or experimental performance data, um, but to date we have still, I think, a process here of research using eye tracking data. And I think particularly when we talk about ways of collecting um, our information technology enhanced, Adrocking can offer a very uh, valid way of collecting data um, as expertise or as development of individuals uh, progress over time. Speaking of Adrocking, we have three different parameters that are typically used. Uh, one is here the fixation. The fixation is defined as a, a miniature eye movements that stabilize relatively the phobia over an object. The eye is never still, but still assume that it is fixed on a certain spot, and this would be one fixation. Like now I focus on, on Reinhardt, this would be my fixation now. And if I jump now from Reinhardt to Rob, for example, this would be a saccade. The second year, a jump between two different fixations. And a third important parameter would be pupil dilation, uh, which we have uh, in when our mental effort, for example, increases, then also our pupil becomes wider, it dilates, uh, which can be traced back to stress, mental effort, and much more. Of course, to light, obviously, uh, if something is, is lighter and brighter, uh, we have a narrower pupil compared to a bit dark situations. Um, eye tracking also historically has been sometimes criticized to have a little ecological validity because it has a very strong history uh, in the lab. And of course, we can now argue with you know, a valid way to ask experts to complete their tasks, not in their natural habitat, so to speak, in their environments, but rather put them in a lab and uh, control them experimentally. Uh, nowadays, we have many ways to still um, use our tracking in more valid ways. We have, for example, um, tabletop um, systems where we um, give relative freedom to the experts to move the head, for example, uh, with the hand, with the gesture. We also have now this new development of mobile eye tracking, the eye of the ears and goggles, that will then uh, trace the eye movements in a very rich uh, ecological environment. This is just to give an example now how those eye tracking devices can look like. These are the examples here from SMI, one company uh, selling those devices. Um, let's get now some examples from my own group. Um, I started with eye tracking some years ago as I was still in Finland, in Turku, working together with Anna Lechtin and Robert Selvig. We um, tried to validate some of the theories that existed in the field of expertise research that made claims about um, the visual superiority of those that are very experienced in their professional domain by using eye tracking data. Um, typically, eye tracking studies use a very small sample size uh, because experts are rare by definition. Uh, so they have uh, typically some sampling error um, in the data. And by using meta-analysis, we can, of course, correct for sample size heterogeneity and then try to get rid of measurement errors in our, in our data. So here we, um, probably that Rob already mentioned, uh, thanks for that. Um, we have collected uh, many different studies using eye tracking on expertise differences. 
um, in different domains, such as medicine, aviation, sports, um, and cumulated those um, effect sizes and corrected them for sampling error. And what we find was indeed large support of the theories um, from Hilde Heider. It seems that experts have uh, less fixations of duration on task redundant areas and more fixations of longer duration on task relevant areas. We also found support for the assumption that experts extend the visual span because they had uh, a longer saccadal length compared to novices who simply use a very short saccad distances, uh, indicating that they are not able to jump from one area to visual field to a second one, but rather they have to make intermediate steps to get there. Um, and we also found partial support for the assumption that um, experts have um, shorter fixation duration overall, partly supporting um, the framework from Hannes Ericsson on long-term working memory, at least for the difference between novices and experts, but not for intermediates and experts. Here we see no difference between those two groups. What this paper also shows here is that historically we have a big body of evidence on inter-individual differences. So typically we can trust experts and novices, or intermediate and novices, um, but we seldomly track them over time. I think it would be now a very good jump for the future, a very good step to do, um, to track the development of individuals as they progress, uh, as they become more skilled in what they do, using eye tracking, and then to validate um, how the um, data from inter-individual differences can relate to intra-individual differences as well. Another important aspect would be how we can use experts um, to train novices. Can we use them as a, as a means to scaffold um, the speed um, of their development of novices? We used one study in a medical domain where we tracked the eye movements of a very experienced uh, radiologist who scanned an X-ray image. Uh, and we superimposed those eye movements on the screen. So the participant was seeing um, a radiograph plus the eye movements of an expert scanning and diagnosing the radiograph. And we wanted to see um, if this uh, would be any, you know, any helpful. Would it support uh, or even promote diagnostic accuracy of people watching eye movements plus the radiograph compared to a control group? And this was indeed the case. So it seems that eye movements can also be used uh, as an example, as a modeling example, as an instructional means to scaffold the development of expertise for those who are not yet as experienced um, as experts typically are. So we see that it's possible to promote the development of individuals when they are or when they have low prior knowledge. Um, another study we did was to see now if we can also help experts. Because especially in the medical field, medicine is a very dynamic environment. It typically changes over time because we have more and more new imaging technologies introduced to medicine, uh, which of course then implies that experts have to adapt to novel situational affordances introduced by novel imaging technologies, for example. Um, and we would try to see whether or not it is possible for experts to transfer their perceptual behavior from a very well known um, visual environment to a less known, less familiar environment art. We did this um, some years ago with a colleague here, also from Finland, um, from Turku. And we could see um, that expertise, at least the eye movements, um, the perceptual behavior from our experts, has been able to transfer from familiar to uh, semi-familiar, but not to unfamiliar environments. So we do see here that it is partly possible um, to um, revise this domain specificity assumption um, in visual expertise. Typically we argue that expertise is so strongly domain specific it hardly transfers to other cases. Um, but if the novel situation um, shares some features that are very familiar to the expert, then it is possible uh, experts can then adapt their visual behavior to also to novel imaging technologies. This was now about fixations in the case. I think I mentioned a third parameter, which is pupil dilation. Um, we had now a master student in Maastricht who did uh, his master thesis uh, using pupillometry, which tracks um, how wide a pupil gets over time. 
Here is an example of this raw data from one of the experts. Um, this was a case here in emergency medicine. Um, and we asked experts to answer um, questions, textbook questions about emergency medicine. Um, the first arrow shows here the time when the question has been stated on the, uh, on the screen. And the second um, arrow here indicates when the answer has been verbalized from the expert. And here we see um, pupil dilation uh, in percentage. So here it becomes wider and here it becomes narrower. What we can see clearly is um, that as the participant tries to phrase an answer, make, make meaning of the question uh, shown on the screen, um, mental effort seems to increase because mental effort is strongly associated with, an, uh, with a wider pupil dilation. And then once the answer is given, mental effort seems to decrease again, um, which indicates that it is possible to use eye tracking also as means to track uh, mental effort from participants, which historically is typically um, been done by questionnaire data. Using cognitive flow theory, for example, a short scale, measuring how, you know, how difficult is this now for you. Very difficult, very easy on this, um, on this range. This is an example of how eye tracking can be used as a physiologic measurement, which is very objective because we cannot easily uh, cognitively influence our pupil dilation. It is very hard to do that. It is a very automatic process that is linked to the automatic nervous system in the body. So it, we argue that it is a very objective way um, of measuring data from our participants. Many examples now from the domain of medicine. I think I have to speak up. Uh, another example is from teaching in classrooms. Um, in Munich, I made a study um, with colleagues where we um, asked teacher experts and student teachers um, to uh, watch at a series of pictures of photographs from classroom situations. The situations were awry in complexity. Some pictures only showed the teacher. Um, some showed um, a diet of a teacher and a student. Some had a small group situation and some other um, scenarios showed the whole classroom um, and the teacher. We then made um, areas of interest, AOIs, a typical term in network research, and then we counted how often our participants would fixate within this area here, which was instructional material, the blackboard, for example, books on a paper, uh, the line table, for example, uh, how often they would fixate um, students, Students could be, of course, here boys or girls, um, or how often the participants would also fixate on the teacher. Um, so the team would here be an area of interest for the teacher. We do see differences um, across expertise levels. Um, expert teachers uh, spend a lot of time focusing on students. Um, they tend to perceptually ignore um, the instructional material, but they are very selective in their attention. Uh, while our student teachers, the novices in our study, uh, spend a lot of time focusing on the teacher, seeing what he is doing, trying to make meaning of this uh, behavior, in particular photographs. There's one example now from classrooms, educational settings, um, that also illustrate how um, iDrakeen can be used to um, explain why some um, participants are very good in making meaning of complex scenarios, in this case, of teaching situations. Uh, and perhaps this can also be used in future studies to help student teachers uh, try to mimic or learn from the eye tracking of the eye movements um, from very experienced teachers um, who are very good in managing classroom situations. Let's come to an end now. Um, brief, short reflections on using eye tracking as technology-enhanced way of data collection. Um, as I said, it's an online measure. Um, so it is uh, possible to track um, the behavior of individuals throughout task completion. Um, it is also unfiltered, large unfiltered. We can hardly control our eye movements. We cannot control our pupil dilation. It's very uh, economic. It can be used partially for 
uh, measuring expertise. Of course, it is just one measure of expertise. It is just you know one approximation um, to explain the superiority in visual fields from highly experienced um, professionals. I would argue that a down or uh, a negative aspect of eye tracking is that you always need equipment, of course, and this equipment can be very, very costly. Um, we also still have some restrictions regarding the ecological validity um, of eye tracking because we still use the lab environment a lot um, for studies, which is, of course, in some situations very good, very handy. Um, and we now see also the development in terms of the mobile eye tracking devices that can then also promote uh, or strengthen the ecological validity um, of eye movements here. Finally, um, I think that eye tracking provides very valuable data. I'm sitting here to promote this uh, technology now, this way of measuring data. Um, of course, I'm also uh, aware of the risks of using only uh, one source of data. Um, so I would strongly advocate to combine um, eye tracking with other measures in mixed method studies. Uh, for example, using the protocol data, but we can then see whether um, our eye tracking data would correspond or even not um, with other measures that we take. In Maastricht now, we have a new project where we also combine eye tracking and fMRI um, to make more meaning of the processing of visual information as it unfolds uh, temporarily. As I said, this whole approach on expertise is largely grounded on inter-individual differences uh, I would call now for more research on intra-individual differences, and I think eye tracking can be used very well as a means to collect data as expertise unfolds over time and to see what changes exactly in the processing of information as participants become more and more experienced in what they do. This could be, of course, in uh, the medical field uh, or in classroom situations of different kinds. Thank you very much for your attention.